Thanks for tuning in to our physics fun channel. Let's do a little bit of a review on what you've learned about magnetism. So here in the notes are a couple of examples of common magnets. So in our classroom, you've seen the bar magnet, the horseshoe magnet, and the donut magnet. But in everyday life, we do see a lot of use of magnets, or at least magnetism. So some of you, I'm sure, went to Japan over spring break, at least I think so, and have probably ridden on the Shinkansen, which is, uh, uses the idea of a superconducting magnet in order to run the train. I think it's called a train. Yeah, run the train. And um, that's exactly why the Shinkansen can go so fast, but you would have a super smooth ride. So that's modern day magnets and magnetism. You also see it in MRI machines, which uh, stand for magnetic resonance imaging. Um, let's see what else. Your book has a lot of examples. Uh, we use magnetism in video recording, uh, in making tapes, in galvanometers, so many applications of magnetism, but I'll let you Wikipedia that for later. So let's start with a little history of how we got to all these modern discoveries in magnetism. So first and foremost, ancient Greeks discovering lodestones. Um, they're responsible for a lot of discoveries, so we'll just add this one to the list. But the ancient Greeks noticed that these stones would attract pieces of metal. Not only did they notice that they would attract pieces of metal, but also that when the stones were spherically shaped, the pieces of metal would more strongly be attracted to the two ends of the lodestone. That kind of that kind of gets us to the point of poles, right? Magnetic poles being the strongest. In the 19th century is where we start to discover a little bit more about the relationship between electricity and magnetism. So sailors, clearly who already had compasses, would notice that when these compasses were struck with lightning, some of them would actually change their polarity. Benjamin Franklin also discovered that when you ran current through a metal pin, you could create a magnet and the pin would then attract pieces of metal. So that's where we get the term electro, electromagnet or electromagnetism. An electromagnet is a magnet that's created by running current through something. It could be a wire, it could be a piece of metal, but it's magnetism that's created from the running of electricity. And I'm sorry that the title here for electromagnetism is followed by the picture of the compass, um, that actually is out of order. I'm sorry, a compass is not an electromagnet because it does not use electricity to create its magnetism. But a compass is basically a free-moving bar magnet. And that's why with the pivot, it can align itself with the Earth's magnetic field. So in the absence of other strong magnets, it will indicate magnetic north and magnetic south. The idea behind the lab that we did when we hung our magnets off the ring stand was that if we were to remove other strong magnets from the room, then all of these suspended bar magnets would align themselves with Earth's magnetic field and would essentially be a compass. Again, not electromagnets. These are just magnets. Now, some of our bar magnets didn't do that, and um, some of our magnets actually pointed the wrong way, and that's because some of our magnets, our bar magnets, did become um, lose their magnetism and then become remagnetized with a switched polarity and some of our compasses were also like that so some of our compasses had the red needle the north needle pointing to the red north side of the bar magnet and that's because the compass had its polarity switched so ideally that north end of the compass would have always pointed away from the north end of the bar magnet but getting back to some general info, magnets do some really cool things. First, and this is one of the factors that makes them different than um, electric poles, is that they only exist as dipoles. Right? To the North Pole, South Pole is bay. To the South Pole, North Pole is bay. There's no lonely magnets here. They, ne they cannot exist as um, monopoles. Although some people speculate that they can exist, but none have been found. Another thing that's really cool about magnets is that if you break a magnet in half, the north pole will remain 
polarized north and the south pole will remain polarized south but then the other two poles on the broken end of the magnet will become the complementary poles. Something else that I personally think is super cool um, was not just about Orsted's discovery, but it was how he made that discovery. So Orsted's discovery was um, he ran current through wire and saw that a compass needle deflected, indicating that there's a magnetic field created when you run current through wire. This discovery, though, was made while he was in the middle of a lecture to students. As a teacher... I can't imagine uh, how cool that is to make some kind of scientific discovery in the midst of lecture, but hopefully that will happen to me someday. So let's move on to magnetic fields. Magnetic fields are indicated by the letter B. So whenever you see B, that is magnetic field, either in magnitude from a calculation or as a vector, meaning on our drawings. So we saw magnetic fields a couple of different ways. First, we mapped the magnetic fields, which some of you found a bit tedious because we needed to draw 15 lines. And what we saw here ideally, and the reason I say ideally again is because some of our compasses had a switched polarity, but what we would have seen if all were working perfectly was that when you put a compass around a bar magnet, the north end of the compass would always point towards the south end of the bar magnet and the south end of the compass would point to the north. So when you have your compass directly to the left of this diagram, meaning it's right in front of the north end of the bar magnet, you would have seen the south tip of the compass pointing directly to the bar magnet and the red tip pointing directly away. So we also saw that the magnetic field lines go out the north or away from north and into the south. And this is always true. So we had that dance we do where we sit in our seats and we spout out the top of our head out the north. And as our hands curl around and come back in towards us, we say in the south. Now, once we uh, drew these lines and connected our dots, we actually saw the magnetic field. So now I'm looking at the picture here on the right. And these are the general directions of the magnetic field lines. Out the north and in the south. You can see that again represented here. And this is where we start the idea of strength of magnetic field as indicated by the number of field lines. Your book uses magnetic flux to describe the strength of a field and flux is defined as the number of magnetic field lines that would intersect a cross-sectional area at 90 degrees. Remember that for a bar magnet, the field is strongest at the poles and therefore on your test or in any diagrams that you do, you should always have more field lines coming out of the poles than you do, uh, say, in the middle of the image. Hey, this was in a college level textbook and we also did this, which was pretty cool. So we put a bar magnet underneath a clear Tupperware bin and we poured in some iron filings. Then we saw that the iron filings align themselves with the orientation of the field, the field lines. So here you can see the field lines for just a north-south bar magnet. And in the picture on the right, you see the field lines for two bar magnets put in close proximity of one another with opposite poles closer. We also talked about this idea of ferromagnetic materials and magnetic domain. So ferromagnetic materials are just materials in which electron spins do not cancel out completely and some of them can align in the same direction. Now strong coupling can also occur between neighboring atoms to form larger groups of atoms whose spins are aligned and this is what we call the magnetic domain. So the, I, the analogy that we used in class was that if we were all electrons sitting in our chairs and we all were facing a different direction, then we would constitute a material that was not magnetized. So all of our spins, represented by the direction we're facing, would generate a magnetic field. And all of those field lines, since they're pointing in completely random and different ways, would not point in the same direction. No two of us would point in the same direction and so we couldn't make the field, the overall field, stronger. Remember from vector addition, 
since the magnetic field is a vector, in order for it to be strong, they need to be parallel and pointing the same direction. Now let's say that we turn something on the screen and some of us, not all of us, but some of us turn to look at the screen at the front of the classroom. That would result in a magnetic domain in which some of us would have electron spins in the same direction and therefore some of us would have magnetic field lines that are going the same direction and the overall magnetic field would be slightly strong. That situation is what we call a weak magnet. Now let's say I put something super interesting up on the screen and then all of us turn to look at the screen. In that case, all of our electron spins would be going the same direction and therefore the magnetic field that was generated by the spins would be reinforcing one another and would be creating a very strong magnetic field. That's what we call a strong magnet. Now these terms refer to the percentage, let's say, or quantity of electron spins that are aligned. That's different than the term that you see in your book for hard and soft hard and soft magnets or magnetization. The terms hard and soft describe the tendency of a material to lose magnetization, meaning hard magnets will be a little more difficult to become magnetized but will also lose their magnetization less easily. A soft magnet is easy to magnetize but would lose its magnetization quickly. We use this idea of aligning um, electron spins or creating magnetic domains in our lab in which we brushed a pin with one side of the bar magnet, therefore using the bar magnet to align the domains of the pin and then magnetizing it. When we inserted that pin through a straw and let that pin move freely in a cup of water suspended by the straw, the pin would align itself with the Earth's magnetic domain in the absence of any other magnets. Moving on to 19.2 in your book and right hand rule number one. Right hand rule number one is the right hand rule in which you curl your fingers and use your thumb. So we're not yet talking about our palms or the back of our palms. Right hand rule number one will tell you either the direction of field or current depending on what you're solving for. In order to use right hand rule number one for a long straight piece of wire, we would point our thumb in the direction of current and then the curl of our fingers will tell us the direction of the magnetic field. Now remember that for magnetic field we're always talking about it uh, usually with reference to a point. Meaning both of these magnetic field lines that you see here, the one in the hand diagram and the one in the flagpole, we could describe as going counterclockwise. But when you're using the terms up, down, right, left, into the page and out of the page, you need to talk about them with a reference point. So for the magnetic field of the flagpole, this was the example from class in which a flagpole is struck by lightning and therefore has current running up it from the bottom to the top. What direction is the magnetic field at different points? So we would orient our thumbs pointing up the flagpole and then we would see the magnetic field or the curl of our fingers as indicated by the blue circle. Now at point A, a point in front of the flagpole, the direction of the magnetic field is to the right. At point B, which is a point directly to the right and in the same plane as the flagpole, the direction of the magnetic field is into the page. For point C, a point behind the flagpole, the direction of the magnetic field is to the left. And at point D, a point directly to the left of the flagpole and in the same plane as the flagpole, the direction of the magnetic field is out of the page. So at all these different points, the answers or the words are different, right? Into the page, out of the page, right and left. However, it's one continuous magnetic field. And that's why the reference point is very important when you're talking about the direction of the field. Think about the direction of the field at a specific place. Now there were two applications for this one right hand rule. The first is what we're looking at right now and the second was for a solenoid 
To use right hand rule number one for a solenoid, your fingers curl in the direction of current and your thumb will indicate the direction of the magnetic field inside the solenoid. So the assignment switches. So in the picture at the top left of your screen, fingers are the field and thumb is the current. And in the picture at the bottom left of your screen, fingers are the current and thumb is the field. For the picture of the solenoid in front of you, I would curl my fingers so that they're coming out of the page, which is like the diagram directly to the left of the solenoid. And then my thumb would tell me the direction of the field lines inside the solenoid, or magnetic north for the solenoid. Now, if current was running the opposite way, meaning current wasn't going out of the page at the top of the solenoid and into the page at the bottom. Let's say that current was running out of the page at the bottom of the solenoid and into the page at the top of the solenoid. Then the magnetic field lines would switch directions. Now if this is confusing, you can also just stick with this first right hand rule number one meaning you can use the assignment of thumb as the direction of current and fingers as the direction of field and when you're applying it to a solenoid as opposed to a long straight piece of wire just apply it to the first loop and when you apply it to the first loop figure out is the magnetic field lines inside of the solenoid going into the page or are they going out of the page and that will tell you the direction of all of the field lines so if I were to apply that perspective to this solenoid here, I would just apply it to the first loop and I would notice that as I travel up the wire into the first loop, that the magnetic field inside of the solenoid is always pointing into or down into the solenoid as opposed to out of. So there's a, there is a way to make the application of the solenoid magnetic field lines a little more simple in that sense. And that's similar to image or um, rather homework 19b, the last question, I believe number eight, gives you that down the barrel perspective of the solenoid. So remember that the magnetic field lines of the solenoid are strongest in the middle of the solenoid where the field lines are the most dense. Now the solenoid itself is an electromagnet because it has a magnetic field due to current or due to electricity. So some of us on our quiz put that the electromagnet is only the solenoid once the iron core is inserted and that's not correct. Remember the solenoid by itself is an electromagnet and when you insert an iron core into the solenoid that just creates a stronger electromagnet. So inserting the iron core reduces the amount of available space on the inside of the solenoid and so it squishes the field lines even more, making them even more dense and more compact. And that's why the field gets stronger with the insertion of a pin or a nail into the solenoid. In order to stop the magnetic field, all you have to do is disconnect the current. Once you stop the current from flowing through the wires, then the magnetic field should also stop. In order to increase the strength of the magnetic field of a solenoid, we already talked about how you can insert an iron core. Secondly, you can also increase the current. And third, although we didn't have a chance to do this in a lab, you could also increase the number of loops that make up the solenoid. Nineteen point three in your book introduces right hand rule number two. So right hand rule number two is the open hand right hand rule and talks about three inputs rather than two. So we still have the direction of moving charges, V. We call it I in right hand rule number one, but V in right hand rule number two. We still have B, which is indicated by the direction of your four fingers. So you can think of that as kind of looking like field lines. Your fingers kind of look like lines. And then the magnetic force would be out the palm if it's a positive charge or out the back of your palm if it's a negative charge. For those of you that prefer left hand rule, then V is still the direction of your thumb, B is the direction of your fingers, and F is still out the palm of your left hand for a negative charge. 
but just stick to whichever method works best for you. Remember that the magnetic force is caused by an external magnetic field, meaning if something generates a magnetic field around it based on moving, uh, moving charge, then that thing cannot experience a magnetic force based on its own field. So for example, if this moving charge Q is moving, it generates its own magnetic field. But Q will not experience a magnetic force unless it moves into an external magnetic field like the blue X's as indicated in this picture. If a magnetic force could be generated by one's own magnetic field, then we would have bar magnets that would just kind of be moving around by themselves because their own magnetic field would cause a magnetic force on themselves. And that's not what we see. Remember that you um, really do need two magnetic fields interacting in order for there to be a force. So the idea is that this moving charge, Q, creates a magnetic field. And if there's a magnetic field, it's almost like there is a magnet there. Because for a magnetic field to exist, there needs to be two dipoles. I'm sorry, a magnetic dipole, which would be two poles. So once that dipole created by charge Q moves into an external magnetic field, that presence of the external magnetic field indicates that there are another set of magnetic dipoles. So it's as if two bar magnets come into close proximity with one another. And when those two bar magnets or those two magnetic fields come in close proximity, that's when you will feel the magnetic force of either repulsion or attraction depending on their orientation. Now, if a moving charge generates its own magnetic field, and we need two magnetic fields to interact for there to be a force, then a charge at rest, which does not generate a magnetic field, will not experience a magnetic force, even if it's still within an external magnetic field. So remember, V cannot be equal to zero in order for a charge to feel a force. Another requirement of magnetic force is that a charge is well, we said it's moving, and not only is it moving, but it must move perpendicular to the field. When a charge moves parallel to, um, to an external magnetic field, the charge will experience no force. So let's do a little bit of practice because I think there was some confusion between right hand rule number one and right hand rule number two. Remember, right-hand rule number one doesn't tell us anything about magnetic force. So in order to solve a force problem, a magnetic force problem in which you don't know the field, you would have to first apply right-hand rule number one to figure out the direction of an external field, and then you would apply right-hand rule number two to figure out the direction of magnetic force. So let's see that in action. So here we have two current carrying wires wire 1, which has current traveling to the right of the page, and wire 2, which has current traveling to the left of the page. Now remember, we're always talking about direction of magnetic field with a reference point. So for the magnetic field number 1, generated by wire 1, I'm going to talk about the point um, above wire 1 and a point at wire 2. So when I apply right-hand rule number one, I would see that anywhere above wire one, the magnetic field comes out of the page. At wire two, that same magnetic field goes into the page. I'm just going to take a second to indicate that here on the drawing so it's a little more familiar. So here above wire one, the magnetic field is coming out of the page. At wire two, the magnetic field is going into the page. And I'm just circling the dot and the X so that you guys can more clearly see it. Now let's figure out the direction of magnetic field B2 that's generated by the current in wire two. So applying right hand rule number one, I would point my thumb to the left and I would see that anywhere above wire two, so at the point of wire one, because it's above wire 2, the magnetic field B2 goes into the page. 
anywhere below wire 2, the magnetic field comes out of the page. So now that we've applied right-hand rule number 1 to figure out the direction of magnetic field, we can apply right-hand rule number 2 to figure out the direction of magnetic force. So the magnetic force on wire 1, remember our on by notation, so force on, comma, by, so force on wire 1 caused by wire 2 would be up. Now let's think about that. So at wire 1, remember at wire 1, we're talking about the field of wire 2. So the field of wire 2 goes into the page, so I'm going to point my four fingers into the page. And then I have to align my thumb so that it goes to the right because that's the direction of current in wire 1. When I do that, I see that the palm of my hand points up the page. And so that's why I have my force right here, force on wire 1 by wire 2 pointing up the page. Now let's apply that to wire 2. So at wire 2, the magnetic field is going into the page. This is the magnetic field caused by wire 1. So I'm looking at the direction of B1 on wire 2. The direction of B1 on wire 2 goes into the page, so I'll point my four fingers into the page. And now I have to look at the direction of current, which is going to the left. So my fingers are going into the page, my thumb will point to the left, and then I see that the palm of my hand points down the page. So here I've indicated the direction of the force on wire 2 caused by the field of wire 1. So these two wires would repel each other. So when current is running in opposite directions in two wires that are parallel to one another, okay, I'll say that again. When two wires are parallel to each other and the current is going in opposite directions, the wires will repel. When two wires are parallel to one another but current is going in the same direction, the wires will attract. Now don't just go and memorize that relationship. Really understand and even draw it out. That would be even better if you drew it out. Draw what is happening in each situation. So first use right hand rule number one to figure out the direction of the magnetic field at different points. Now remember when you're figuring out the direction of field, you're talking about the magnetic field generated by each wire meaning I'm going to look at wire 1 and I'll draw its magnetic field. Then I'm going to look at wire 2 and I'll draw its magnetic field. However, when I'm talking then about magnetic force, I need to talk about or use the field generated by the other wire because magnetic force is only experienced by an external magnetic field, not for one's own magnetic field. If you need more practice with this, you can definitely refer back to your packet. And there's additional uh, really good practice problems written out in the chapter review of your book. So I would suggest going to your book and trying out some of the conceptual questions. You won't have any calculations on your test, so go ahead and skip over those. But definitely look for some more practice if you feel like you need it. Thanks guys for tuning in, and I hope you had fun on our Physics Fun channel. Thank you.